With the latest on our hometown teams, this is Sports Wrap-Up with Bob Kuczynski on WBBZ-TV, your hometown television station. Now, from our studios at the Eastern Hills Mall, here is Bob Kuczynski. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Bob Kuczynski with you on Sports Wrap-Up. I hope you enjoyed the brand new open to the show. I did. Great show lined up for you tonight. We're going to talk about the Super Bowl. We're going to talk about the Sabres. Everything with an S, apparently. But first, tonight, I want to talk about the Buffalo Sabres because the team right now, well, they're struggling. They're going to be playing the Ottawa Senators tonight on the road, and that game time is at 7.30. The Sabres are dead last in the Northeast Division. They've lost six of their last seven, despite the best efforts of Thomas Vanek, who's been uh, NHL Player of the Week. But the Sabres tonight will be a topic of focus because later on in the program, we'll have on Bill Whippard, who is the official photographer for the Buffalo Sabres. I love this guy's work. He's a great photographer. He goes all the way back to the 70s, and we're going to reminisce and look at some of the great photos that Bill has taken over his 38 years there with the team. Also on tonight's show, we're going to talk about the Super Bowl. Dan Mecca will be on talking about the commercials in the Super Bowl, Dan Mecca is president of Abby Mecca, uh, and he's a, it's a great ad agency, and he's going to talk about the various uh, Super Bowl commercials. But last week, if you remember, Karen Reese, who is psychic extraordinaire, and if you watched uh, WBBZ Monday night, Secrets from Beyond, Karen Reese and Robert Saviolo are on. And last week, I asked Karen to give us a Super Bowl prediction. And Karen said, Bob, I don't really like to give scores. I don't want gamblers, you know, camped outside of my house. But her prediction was that there would be an unusual run in the Super Bowl. And, of course, you all remember that Jacoby Jones returned a kickoff for 108 yards. Not to mention, I mean, there was also that bizarre, you know, safety where, uh, you know, the punter was running around in the end zone. So Karen Reese, true to her word, and you can watch Secrets from Beyond. The next show will be Monday, February 18th, right here, 9 o'clock on WBBZ-TV. A couple other things. The UB National Football Signing Show will be seen live Wednesday night, February 6th, 8 o'clock. Paul Peck, Coach Quinn talking about the latest recruits that have signed to play at UB. We'll have a full audience of UB football players, cheerleaders, dancers. We'll talk to some of the current players, and Paul Peck and Coach Quinn will run down the new stars for the next four years with UB Football Bulls. And last and certainly not least, a sport near and dear to my heart, high school wrestling. The New York State Section 6 Wrestling Championships will be held Saturday at UB's Alumni Arena. Both Division 1 and Division 2 wrestling starts at 10 a.m. You'll be able to go out there and see all the young men from Section 6 competing for a Section 6 championship and a chance to go to Albany to wrestle for a New York State championship. That's Saturday at UB. Wrestling starts at 10, and I'll be out there. Hope to see you out there. We're going to take a break. We'll come back. Dan Mecca will be talking about Super Bowl commercials right after this. Welcome back to Sports Wrap-Up. Bob Kaczynski in our WBBZ-TV studios. Super Bowl was played Sunday. Great game. The Ravens came out on top despite the blackout. And we have with us one of the top ad execs in Western New York, uh, Dan Mecca, who's president of Abby Mecca Ad Agency, and he's a really sharp guy. We brought him in to talk about, what else, Super Bowl commercials, because while most people watch the game for the game, many also watch it for the commercials. Dan had his opinion on who was number one and who wasn't. Commercials have become a, a huge part of the Super Bowl. Uh, first, your, your general impression of, of Sunday night's batch of spots. Uh, I, I think it was a pretty good year for Super Bowl commercials. Um, you know, there have been years where there are a lot of disappointments, but there was a good crop of very good commercials, um, a great deal of OK Walter. commercials, and Together, only a few really bad perfect. ones. One thing that strikes me as being different is you can see these commercials ahead of time. I mean, you go to YouTube or various sites, CBS Sports, NFL, they've got the commercials up there, so there's, there's not that sense of anticipation as maybe in the past for those who are web savvy. No, absolutely, and, and the advertisers really have leveraged the social media to create buzz about their spots. If you think about it, 114 million, 114 million people were anticipated to watch the Super Bowl. So that's a lot of eyeballs, but if you could get that up to 9 million more just through social media and online viewing, you know, why not? So the effort was definitely placed on 
uh, generate more views via the internet and social media by these advertisers. Some of them, though, uh, like Oreo, didn't reveal their spot. Chrysler didn't reveal their spots for Jeep and Ram until, until the Super Bowl, so it was truly a reveal. Okay, the national consensus seems to be that the uh, highest rated spot was, again, Budweiser. Again, it features a Clydesdale. Your impression? Uh, I think they, they, uh, you know, they, they lived up to their legacy in that respect. Um, everybody kind of anticipates the Budweiser spots. You know, Bud had, uh, or Anheuser Busch had a Budweiser Black Crown spot in there, three spots, which I thought fell flat. Uh, Bud Light with the Voodoo Dolls, that was okay. But the Clydesdale one was really heartwarming, and that really spoke to the heritage of Budweiser and was, was really true to that brand. And so uh, no, no surprise that it was a fan favorite. Next was Tide and the Joe Montana stain spot, which I really found funny. Yeah, that was, it was funny, and humor is a great technique. I mean, at the end of the day, these advertisers want people to like their brands and feel good about them, and humor is a great way to do that. And Tide did that really well. I mean, they, it was topical. They had the San Francisco 49ers in that spot, Montana, an icon with that team and fans. And at the same time, it spoke to the brand message of Ty. And ironically, the woman, the actress in the spot who played the wife, is a 1996 graduate of City Honors. No kidding. Hey, hats off to Buffalo. Yeah. Great. And then the third spot was the uh, farmer spot, yeah. which was for Dodge Ram truck, which I really enjoyed. And But I think maybe there's a generational thing. You had to know who Paul Harvey was to appreciate the spot. Yeah, they were, uh, Dodge and Chrysler, they were, um, they were aiming high on that one in terms of an older audience. They were, they were looking for... For people to recognize Paul Harvey for the for the broadcasting icon he was, um, but you know when you look, when you think about it, that message was phenomenal. And anytime you could fill two minutes with voice and still photographs, uh, it was just a tremendous piece of corporate advertising or brand advertising, which I think is what you want to do in the Super Bowl. And I think Ram hit it out of the park. Okay, Dan Mecca, uh, advertising you know expert extraordinaire. What spots did you like? Uh, I like the I like the the, uh, the Ram spot number one. That was great. I think Audi did a terrific job as well with the Prom. Now that was just a feel good spot, but at the same time it was like it was telling you that you know you drive an Audi and you feel more confident because you know you're in a great sedan and a great brand. Uh, the Mercedes spot with William Defoe because they used the stones and it was a it was a, a great spot as well, a great story. Um, but I also like the Oreo spot. I mean, I thought that was funny. Uh, I was watching that with, with my kids or young kids, and they thought that was great. And at the end of the day, they're also you know, staying true to their brand message about Oreo being a great cookie. And oddly, the time-tested uh, uh, um, you know, slam dunk, chimpanzees and monkeys. None this year. None this year. Yeah, I know. I think. Well, you you, you saw some some uh, some of that in uh, the spots where they had the space babies. I think that was for for Kia. You had some animals in there in the Clydesdale. So anytime you can use babies and animals in a spot, you have the ability to really leverage humor. So you saw some of that. But um, yeah, I I would have I was hoping to kind of see another um, another. I think it was for Careers.com where they use the the chimpanzees because that's all, they always do a good job. But you know what? At four million dollars a spot. And then you got to produce the spot. You know, it's it's a it's a tough decision for a lot of advertisers to to get some kind of payback on that kind of investment. CBS was faced with a real dilemma with the blackout at, it, within the stadium. You can't just fill with spots that are paid spots because those spots are strategically placed throughout the game. So somebody had to sit there and make a decision, a conscious decision as to what to use. And I see they only went to a couple breaks and then they stopped. Yeah, it was interesting because the first break they had to take, they had no audio coming out of the broadcast booth, so they just you know, stayed on with the, uh, with the video, and then they went to a break. And that f coming out of that first break, or going into that first break, you saw a spot for Subway, and a spot for Bud Light, and then a spot for the NFL. Well, when they came back and Tasker took over, he got them through that time. The next break they went to, you saw the same spot for Subway, the same spot for Bud Light, and the same spot for the NFL. I think those guys got a free spot because they had an unanticipated break. They had to do something, so they, they basically gave those guys two spots each. That's my contention, but, you know, I don't see them spending for spending money for two of the same spots. Most watched television event ever. They have a catastrophe. They lose power. Who do they turn to? Number 89, Buffalo Bills utility man, Steve Tasker. Yeah, talk about special teams. I mean, that's the definition of a special teams player, somebody who can think on their feet. And, you know, this is, this is his second career. I, know, I thought he did a phenomenal job, you know, literally and figuratively taking the ball and running with it. And that was Dan Mecca, president of Abby Mecca Ad Agency. I want to thank him for being on the show. When we come back, we'll be talking about Buffalo Sabres, Buffalo Sabres photography with Bill Whippert right after this on WBBZ TV.
Welcome back to Sports Wrap-Up. In studio right now, we have the official photographer of the Buffalo Sabres, Bill Whippert. Been shooting for the team for 38 years. Doesn't look yeah. that old, <laughs> but he's a child prodigy. And, yeah. Bill, thanks for all. It's great having you down here. I admire your work. Uh, actually, I've been following your work because we're on Facebook, so social media. Yeah. Uh, his best shots now are of his daughter, uh, which you basically you've chronicled her entire career. So. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Well, it's an important thing for dad to do, to be uh, you know, proud of their daughter, and I've always been proud of her. She's 13, oh. plays a lot of sports, and it's a good uh, outlet for me to... Uh, use my photography. And that 38 years of NHL work has now gotten you prepared to cover all her activities. Exactly, yeah. Seventh and eighth grade basketball and uh, <laughs> hockey and uh, all of that. My training with the NHL has... Uh, so while mom and dad are down there with an iPhone, you've got probably this humongous camera, right, with strobes, and you're making sure you cover, cover every angle. Yeah, but we try to pass the information on to all the other parents so that their, <laughs> their photos are improving, too. Bill, I want to have you on the show because you've been shooting for the Sabres since the 70s. And uh, in a minute, we're going to take a look at some of your work. Uh, but you, you started out in high school. I was amazed you sent me some information. Uh, you know, basically, Paul Whelan, for those who remember, Paul was the original, you know, PR guy, television guy. I mean, he did everything for the Sabres. And, and he allowed you to come in as a, as a high school student to take uh, Yeah, photos? just a quick story. I mean, it was really nice. And, and uh, I was a, uh, a senior at St. Joe's. And uh, he actually brought in a highlight film back in, that's, they were actually films, and he brought it into a father-son uh, communion breakfast at St. Amelia's. And when it was over, I just, I had the guts to go up to him and ask him and say, you know, I'm kind of, I've always been a hockey fan, I played hockey in the town, and I was wondering if I had a, if there's a chance for me to maybe take some pictures at a game, and at that point he could have said no, and he said yes, he gave me a chance, and uh, I kept shooting pictures that year. That was the year that we went to the Stanley Cup Finals, we lost to the Flyers, I was able to take pictures on the ice when the Flyers won the Cup. And uh, I stayed in uh, Buffalo for um, college, went to Buff State, and continued working, uh, doing some pictures for the team while I was at Buff State, and it went from there. But so the photos you actually took when you were in high school, the team used those photos? They did. Um, I shot a couple games, and the third game I ever shot, um, it was in January of uh, 1975, uh, Gilbert Perot got hip-checked by Tracy Pratt and Mike Robitaille, and uh, I got a picture of it, and it was a pretty catastrophic injury at the time for Perot, and I got a great shot of it, and I had a friend process the film for me. Another friend made the prints. I took it down to Paul Whelan to like a week later. No immediacy back then. There was no, uh, <laughs> he had to wait for everything to get done. <laughs> took Paul the, the print, and he goes, oh, this is great. Would you mind if we used it in our program? And I said, no, I think I'd be all right. He says, well, we pay $5. Wow. That's perfect, and if you'd like, I'll give you a credential for the rest of the year. So I said, you know what, I think I could do this. So I was able to shoot the rest of the games, and uh, cool. it went from there. We, we actually have some of his photos, and, and so instead of just talking about let's take a look at some of the black and white stuff from early on. What are we looking at? And that at? would be from that year. That's actually from the Stanley Cup Finals. That's a, uh, game six of the finals. The, uh, that's one of the rare shots of the French Connection together, uh, uh, Martin and Perot and Robert. And... Uh, uh, way in the background, in the, about in the middle, just above the flyer's head, there's a little boy, and that's uh, Ted Darling's son, Joel. Oh, wow. Who's about yeah. eight years old in the photo, and he went on to be the executive producer of Hockey Night in Canada and still works for the CBC. So that was just, uh, that was, you know, I was senior at Joe's. I shot pictures at that, okay. uh, at that game. And, and then uh, this is, we're probably going to see a bunch of black and whites here shot in the 70s. That's Danny Gare celebrating a goal. All these pictures were shot on black and white film that I would process in the basement and make prints. And um, uh, That's a great shot. Richard Martin there against the Leafs, of course. You know, you, what's cool is you look back at this and you see all the different uh, things that have changed. Obviously, no helmets. The style of the skates have changed. The equipment is so much smaller. The guys yeah. look like they're junior players. No advertising on the boards. Um, I was joking one of our team, with one of our team uh, sales guys. I said, you know what? If I ever win the lottery, I wouldn't change my life too much. One is I'd have more people carry my gear, and I'd, I'd buy off all the Dasher advertising so that there was no ads <laughs> on the boards because it, the pictures are so much cleaner. You don't you know, have things right. distracting the, in the background. The background. That's Rick, There's Rick Dudley. I love yeah. that shot with Rick the Rick Dudley with the headband playing against yeah. the L.A. Kings. The no helmets is just insane. Okay. Well, and here's then a uh, Gilbert one. Perot winding up for a slap shot, full house. Probably a Sunday night game. These play a lot of Sunday nights. We're playing some Sunday nights this year, which is a throwback. That's another rare shot of the connection together. It, some of it, you might be losing it, but they're actually all um, there. Perot, Martin, and Robert against, uh, looks like, St. Louis. And then moving into some other eras. This is uh, after Perot scored his 500th goal, celebrating with Mike uh, Felino, which is cool because now I'm shooting Mike's his son, son yeah, Marcus. Cool. So... Um, 
Scotty. And uh, Scotty and Lindy and Joe Crozier. Joe's still uh, around the, the arena. He's a great guy. And then uh, oh, to get the pictures that it, where there's some interplay between the players and the fans and obviously in happy times, playoff games, the celebrations like that, you know, they're, um, they make for great photos. You're always looking for that. Um, I've always been a big fan of putting cameras in, in weird places like up in the catwalks, uh, although this picture I was actually up in the roof. Uh, that was, I think, the last year in the odd, one of the last years in the odd, taking pictures of hash. I love this shot right here. That's uh, Tony Tanti, played with us for a little while. That's in the odd. It reminds me of the classic Bobby Orr photo where he's uh, suspended in air. Yeah, it didn't win, it didn't win a Stanley yeah, Cup but game. But, uh, and that's uh, uh, Brad May and Pat LaFontaine celebrating a goal in the uh, Bruins series uh, the year of the uh, May Day goal. That, and then uh, being on the ice, I mean, it's just a, in addition to taking these pictures, it's just a thrill for me to be a part of these things, to be so close to all the action and be around the guys. That's the last night in the odd, and uh, to be, you know, to know what was going to happen yeah. and be in the right spot to make these pictures. And that's uh, LaFontaine putting the last putting puck. It in. Yep. Yeah. Okay, this, now these are, these are the strobes, and I really wanted to get into this because this fascinates me. You, know, you saw this on Facebook. Right. I just tweeted it. I put a couple of things up there. That, that's, a, that's a flash. That's a one, of the, one of eight high-powered strobes. They're, they're high-powered flash units that we have in the arena like most uh, arenas do, and uh, that's me setting them up uh, or trying to fine-tuning them before the start of the season this year, adjusting some stuff. Um, they're like the flash on your camera, except they're about 25 times more powerful, and there's eight of them, and it basically just allows you to take better quality pictures because of the extra light. Um, the advantage is you get better color. And better. you set them off remotely with your camera. With the camera, exactly. It's wired into the camera, either remotely or hardwired. And um, the, uh, the disadvantage is that you like to flash on your camera. You have, to, um, you have to wait for the flash to recycle. So I can only shoot one picture every two or three seconds, whereas if you're shooting with the available light in the arena, um, you can shoot with your motor drive and get six, seven, eight frames per second. But the trade-off is worth it because right. the quality is so much better. And it, everything's completely evenly lit. Yep. And you're yep. able to catch. Ideally. Uh, how, how fast is the shutter speed on, on something? Uh, like the fla the, it's the speed of the flash. In that case, it actually is stopping the action. It's going off at about a thousandth of a second, which you could set your camera to as well and, and freeze the action too. I mean, for parents that are trying to shoot their kids at the right. North Town Center or any of the rinks, um, you can do it available light and do it with the right settings. But unfortunately, those arenas are a little too dark. To okay, do it. so where do you position? Where, where's your favorite spot to shoot the photos once you're at the first Niagara Center? Uh, different positions offer, you know, have different benefits. Um, I like to shoot between the benches sometimes because you have a view of both nets. You can look into the goal. Um, great view of the um, the benches. Uh, the downside is that you see, like that that picture right there is shot from between the benches. That's Rob Ray sort of questioning somebody on the other bench, right, Razor being Razor. Um, that picture is also shot from between the benches. That's a pretty famous picture. That's Derek Plant scoring an overtime uh, series winning goal against Ottawa uh, the first year in the new building in 1996. Uh, the puck's just going in off of Ron Tugnett's right. glove. So, and that's uh, Rhett Warner uh, with Dominic Kasich. So sometimes I'm between the benches, but right now I spend more of my time shooting um, in a corner position uh, down by the Zamboni, which affords a full view of the ice. I love the bend in the hockey stick here. I mean, I, I, I'm sure that's what you like about the photo. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you're now, average. I'm a very amateurish photographer, but I like to play and I like to take, I, I was telling you the story before we started, I started taking, you know, high school shots of my sons and stuff like that. And the one thing about photography that I love is, you know, you never know, you, you, you just snap and you hope to get something. And sometimes you, sometimes you miss and sometimes you capture magic. And I imagine after 38 years, though, that's still the thrill of it, too. You snap and you hope you get something. And and yeah, you just you, never know. And then sometimes you think you missed it and you got it. And, and a lot of times vice versa. Um, that, I think that was Jason Palmerville on that slap shot for some reason. And that's with the strobe, so I've only got the one picture on it. It's not a sequence. I'm able to time his shots. Because, you, you know, it's sort of a quick process between what you're seeing and thinking and hitting the trigger and focusing and composing. And so for some reason, I'm always able to time his shots pretty well. I get a lot of pictures like that. Um, there's other times when you think you nailed it and a referee skates right by you at that moment and you you've it. lost it. The big difference now, of course, is it's immediate. You can look in your, at your camera and, and get an idea. Yeah, of what you'll you know got. how it's going. Right, as opposed to back in the day where you had to take it to a developer. And when it first changed, around 2001 or so was the transition point between the film and the uh, digital. And when it first changed, it was kind of a disappointment because I liked that feeling of shooting at night, gutting the slides process the next day, and then going and opening up the box of slides. It was like Christmas morning every time to see what you got. 
that feeling went away in about a month of, <laughs> of being able to see immediately on the right. back of the camera. Now, any two-year-old, you take a two-year-old's picture, and they want to run up to you and, you know, what do you got on the camera? And the photo you're still waiting to take is of the Sabres skating around with the cup in their hand. I am waiting. I will be there. No matter how long it takes. <laughs> no matter how. If my daughter's pushing me around in a wheelchair to take the picture, <laughs> I will be there. Who knows what you'll be using then? <laughs> exactly. It would be telepathy. Um, I want to give, first of all, Bill, as an official photographer of the Sabres, you work for the Buffalo News forever, but you're no longer yeah. there at the News. So I want to yeah. give you a plug, give your business a plug. If oh. somebody wants to hire Bill to take oh. photos, how do they do well, that? Well, that's great. But, and you mentioned Buffalo News. I should say I had 32 great years there. I started in 1980. I uh, met my wife uh, on a shoot through the news, uh, had a great career, loved the people there. It was outstanding. The nature of the business was that uh, things were changing and they were offering some buyouts, and it seemed like that was the time. But, uh, I, you know, shout out to the news. It was a great place to work, and I, they treated me like, uh, like gold. Um, now I'm concentrating on my Sabres work as team photographer, but I'm also freelance commercial photographer, shoot weddings, family stuff. I love being around families, doing all of their stuff. I can be reached... Uh, uh, via Facebook or uh, Bill Whippert at AOL.com. And, um, uh, you know, just love doing lots of little things for families and uh, do some photo coaching, too, if people want to learn some ins and outs. I love, uh, you know, t talking to groups and families or, you know, individuals about uh, improving their photography. Well, you know, Bill, I have, I have a little sports website, All Sports Western New York. So anytime you feel like contributing photos, because I can't afford them. I mean, yeah, this guy's a top I... photographer for the NHL. Happy, Bill, happy to donate. It's great to have you on the show. Uh, I hope that you, like every Buffalo Sabre fan, have that experience of watching the team skate with the cup. And if they do, I know you'll take the best photo there. Well, I appreciate that. It's an honor to be on the same station that carries the Rockford Files. I've been a Rockford Files fan for my whole life. And to be on the same station as Jim Rockford is a, is a thrill. Well, I'd like to say you're going to get a DVD gift set, but we don't have them. That's <laughs> all right. I've got them all. Bill, <laughs> thanks for being on the show, and I look forward to watching more of your work. All right. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate it. We'll be back to wrap up Sports Wrap Up right after this. Guests of Sports Wrap-Up receive a gift certificate to dine at Elia DiPaolo's Restaurant Ringside Lounge, 3785 South Park Avenue in Blaisdell. That's going to do it for tonight. We'd like to thank Dan Mecca and, of course, Bill Whippert. Until next week, this is Bob Kaczynski saying have yourself a good night and a much better tomorrow.